talk about how atoms interact in a material. Because when we talked about bonding, it really is just two atoms, one next to another, right? Um, but what happens in a material? And how many atoms do you think is inside a typical thing that you might use? So let's assume we talk about a cell phone. You all have cell phones. How many atoms do you think is inside your cell phone? So let's do some calculations. Don't, don't look it up online. <laughs> So let's assume we'll just pick an um, element. Obviously, your cell phone is made up of lots of different elements, but to make our calculations simple, let's just say it's made out of silicon, because it, it does have quite a bit of silicon for the glass and also for the semiconductor. So let's assume your cell phone is made out of silicon. I looked this up online. The density of silicon is 2.3 grams per cc. And what would you estimate to be the size of your cell phone? Just looking at your cell phone, what do you think it is? So volume of your phone, roughly, what do you think? Thickness, can we call it one centimeter, roughly? I know it's, it's probably thinner than that, but OK, one. What about the width? Seven or eight, let's just say 10 makes the math easier. How about the length? 15? OK. All right, so that's the volume. How would you calculate how many atoms are in a cell phone? Where would you start? And do you need any other information besides what I've given you or what is on here? So you know the volume, you know the density. So if your cell phone were made entirely of silicon, how much do you think your cell phone will weigh? Right? You multiply these two, and you get the grams. So can someone calculate that for me? 345 grams. So you have 345 grams of silicon. Do you need any other information? So you need the atomic mass, so silicon, the atomic mass is 4.7 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per atom. So you have how many atoms? So you take this number and divide it by this, and what do you get? Times 10 to the 24 atoms of silicon. And if you were to convert this into moles, how would you do that? How many moles of silicon is there? You know Avogadro's number? Okay, so we know Avogadro's number. So if you convert this into moles, how many moles would there be? Right, because this, this divided by that number it should be around 10, 11, 12, something like that. So around 12 moles of silicon, right? All right, so that's how many atoms that we're dealing with when you look at just the regular cell phone. Okay, it's a lot. And so we can't just look at how two atoms connect to one another. It doesn't tell us the whole story. We need to look at what happens when you have this many atoms next to one another. And if you look at an atom, so I'll just call this atom A. We know that it has electrons, 2s, 2p, and so forth. And we know that the energy level goes up as we go away from the nucleus. What happens when you put two atoms together? And let's just make it easy, call them the same atoms. We know that. This atom will have two electrons in the 1s, and this will have two electrons in the 1s. If they're really close to each other, we know because of the Pauli exclusion principle that we cannot have four electrons in the 1a, right? So what happens is that the energy level will be slightly separated so that they can both still have electrons in the 1s and the 2s, 
to P, and so forth. Okay, so now what happens when we have 12 moles of atoms next to each other? You actually get a band. So you get 1s levels very, very close to one another, so close that they look continuous within the energy level. And then you get the 2s, 2p, and so forth. Now these energy levels, depending on what the electrons look like and what the atoms look like in the first place, they could be very close together or they could be very far apart. And we will talk more about that. That has a lot to do with the properties of the material later on. Okay, but we won't get into too much of it right now. Today what I want to go over is the crystal structure, how the atoms actually arrange themselves when you have 1 times well, 12 moles of atoms next to each other. Let's consider carbon. How, what kind of materials are made out of carbon? What, what are some materials that you could think of that are made out of carbon? Diamond. So diamond is one. It's very hard. We know diamond can be used in tooling, right, to cut things, to cut metal. It's very, very hard. It's transparent. It's electrically insulating or has a, it's a large band gap semiconductor. You can see it's mostly electrically insulating. What other form can carbon take right now? Pencil, the graphite, right? So it's black, not transparent at all, not hard at all, right? Very, very soft. You barely have to press it onto the paper and it leaves behind a layer of carbon that comes off of your pencil. And that's what you're writing with. So graphite is also made out of carbon. Anything else that you could think of that is made out of carbon? I don't know, have you ever heard of carbon nanotubes? So it's, uh, it can be used as an electrically conducting layer, can be very, very thin, is very strong. Okay, so you have these three different kinds of carbon, and there are other forms of carbon, but these three common ones that you might have heard of that behave very, very differently, right? And we had talked about before, when you have elements, the valence electrons determine a lot of its properties. So how come carbon have the same number of valence electrons, whether they're in the diamond form or the graphite form or the carbon nanotube form, how come they behave so differently? And the reason is because of the crystal structure. So that's what I want to talk about today. You have two basic kinds of materials. You have things that are amorphous. So this is, means disordered, crystalline, which means you have long range order. And I want to talk about what happens when you have these two different kinds, orders to materials. If you think about a crate of oranges, if you go to the market and you see a crate of oranges and somebody just threw the oranges in, it's usually disordered, right? It's just a jumble of oranges. I'm using oranges because they're spherical. A lot of it's kind of how we think of atoms. If you threw in a crate of oranges, it might look something like that. So that would be a disordered arrangement of the oranges. But if you were to take that crate and shake it, what would happen? And the same thing that happens when I'm trying to put coffee beans in a container and it's a little bit too full. So I shake my coffee bean container so that the level goes down. What happens? Why is that level going down? You're giving this a little bit of extra energy and allowing the oranges to move. And if the oranges can move, then they're going to fill in the lowest energy state possible. So they will end up at the lowest energy state possible. So if you continue to shake it, it will actually start to order themselves. You might get something like this. So it takes up less space. But it's also all the atoms, or oranges, are at the lowest energy state possible. This orange right here has this empty space below it, so it's at a, it has a certain amount of potential energy. So it's at a higher energy state when it comes down. Here it's at the lowest possible energy state. And so for most materials, a crystalline form occupies the lowest energy state possible. And that's why most materials are crystalline, and we'll talk about why that is. And how they're arranged and how that changes causes carbon, for example, to be 
diamond versus graphite versus carbon nanotubes. And then also for another material that's um, similar where the structure has a lot to do with its properties is um, silica, SiO2. So you can make glass with amorphous SiO2 or silica, but silica in its crystalline form, does anyone know what that's called? It's quartz, glass, but it can also be quartz. And quartz is the crystalline form. And quartz and glass behave differently, and it also has to do with its crystal structure. So because we can represent atoms as spheres, um, there are seven basic structures. And you can read more about them in page 60 of your text. Okay, they will list all the seven different structures. Some are cubic, some are tetragonal, it looks like a rectangle, others are lopsided. But we will, most of the materials that we will talk about will be cubic. So, the, and because it's the simplest for us to understand and to draw, that's what I will focus on. But everything I talk about in terms of cubic structures also applies to the other six structures. So let's talk about the cubic system. And before I talk too much about the cubic system, I wanted to develop a common language so that we can talk about this in a little bit easier way. Um, so I will give you some definitions. A unit cell is the smallest repeatable unit in a structure, in a crystalline structure. And let's talk about simple cubics. That's, that's the easiest one to draw. A cubic structure basically has a unit cell that looks like a cube, but because this is called a reduced sphere model, the, what I've drawn, because I'm drawing the spheres really small as dots on the corners, what the structure actually looks like is expanded sphere model, and I will try to draw that. It's a little bit more difficult to draw, so usually I will do it this way, but this is just so you know what it actually looks more like, something like that. So it actually expands, and the corner atoms are touching each of the corner atoms. So if you were to draw a lot of them, like in a two-dimensional way, and so on and so forth. And this would represent one unit cell. This would be another unit cell. And if you were to draw it three-dimensionally, you would just draw this down and back as well. So that's how, a, in a simple cubic, how the atoms come together. And then you have two other in the cubic system. So in the cubic system, you have simple cubic, all right, SC face-centered cubic, FCC, or you have body-centered cubic, or BCC. So this is a simple cubic. If we were to draw the FCC in the reduced sphere model, you have an atom on each corner, and the atom in the center of each of the faces. And if I were to draw just the front face here, in the expanded sphere model, it would look like this. Okay, so that would be an FCC. If you were to look at the FCC in kind of this two-dimensional way, it will look like, and this would be a unit cell. This would be another unit cell. What about the BCC? Reduced sphere model. Six atoms, one on each corner, and one in the center. And then if you were to look at the body diagonal, so this plane, if I were to take this plane that cuts through the middle of the unit cell, if this is A, all the edge length would be A, so this would be A, and this diagonal would be B be longer than A. So if we were to look at that plane, it would look something like this. Okay, so you have these three basic crystal structures. So that's the first definition is a unit cell. In a cubic system, you have three unit cells 
You can have this as the simplest repeating unit. You have FCC or BCC as the simplest repeating unit. Okay, the next definition is coordination number. Coordination number is the number of nearest neighbors. All right, so if we look at the simple cubic, how many nearest, let's just pick one of the atoms, let's say this one. How many nearest neighbors does this atom have? Atoms that are all equal distance, six, right? How did you come up with that? So they're all equal distance apart, so you have one here, and we know that because they're in a crystal structure, the multiples of these unit cells, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have CN equals six for simple cubic. How about for an FCC? So we know in this one, all the corner atoms are touching, so they're all equal distance apart. In a FCC, so let's use this one. So we know this one is touching the face center atom, right? The corner ones are touching the face center. So we have one right here, two, three, in this one, and then in this unit cell over here, it has a face center. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the face centered one, seven, eight, nine. So you have these four atoms, uh, unit cells in the back, and then you have four more unit cells coming out the front. So each one of these corner ones is touching 12 of the face ones. Okay, so the and the reason why it doesn't matter if I use the corner one or the face one as my, to like do my calculation is because if I draw this face centered here. So over there I use this as my unit cell, right? But I can also use the, this as my unit cell. It's exactly the same. So I could say these are my, this is my repeating unit, or this is my repeating unit. You're just shifting the origin of what you're drawing your squares or cubes are, right? And that's what makes them repeatable units, because it really doesn't matter where you say, is, is this my corner atom or is this my corner atom? It doesn't matter. It will form the same unit cell. Okay. How many nearest neighbors does a simple cubic have? Simple cubic is actually really easy. So what is the coordination number for BCC? We know for simple cubic, it was six. For FCC, it's 12. What about for BCC? Uh, FCC, it doesn't matter which atom we pick as what we want to look at. We could say, because all of the atoms in this crystal structure are in identical environments. Okay, so let's just use the easiest one to see which is the middle one. And it's touching all the corner ones. So how many is it touching? Eight. Okay. Now we're gonna use this information to look at what is something called atomic packing factor. So we have two definitions, a coordination number, the unit cell. Now we want to look at atomic packing factor, and that's the number of whole atoms in a unit cell. So we'll start with the simplest, simple cubic. Because it's cubic, we know the length, the width, and the depth of the cube is all the same, and we'll just call it A. So volume of the cube, or our unit cell, it's A cubed. And if we were to look at just the front plane of this unit cell, we know that all of the atoms are touching. It'll look something like that. So A equals 2R. R is the radius of the atom. The volume of the atom equals 4 third pi R cubed. 
and APF equals the volume of atoms inside unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell. So it's basically telling us how fully packed or how dense that unit cell is filled with atoms. Does it have a lot of empty space or does it have a lot of atoms? So the volume of atoms. So this is pretty easy. The volume of the unit cell is A cubed. Volume of atoms is uh, inside the unit cell. We know the volume of each atom. Now we need to know how many atoms are in each unit cell. So in this one, how many whole atoms is in a unit cell? Okay, why not six or eight? I see eight atoms here. Right, because each corner atom is being shared by eight unit cells. Does anyone want to see that? So this atom is being shared by, so this atom is being shared by these four unit cells and then four more in front. So this corner atom sits on the corner of eight unit cells and it's evenly divided. One eighth of it is in each unit cell. So each corner atom are shared by eight unit cells. So we have eight of them. Each one is shared by eight. So you have one total. So APF is one times four third pi r cubed divided by a equals 2r, so 2 times r cubed. And then the r's cancel out, 0.52, or 52%, like he said, of the unit cell is filled with atoms. So it's actually a pretty open, empty kind of structure, right? Only half of the available space is taken up by actual atoms. So we will calculate atomic packing factor for BCC. For BCC, we can't really look at this front face to give us any information about the relationship between A and R because the atoms are not touching. Which plane should we be looking at in order to know which, where the atoms are actually touching? We know the body-centered atom is touching the corner atoms, so we want to take that middle slice, right? This one. So we have this. This is A. That's A right here. This is B. And then we have something that looks like something like. And this is C. C equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 4R. Volume of the unit cell is still the same. A cubed. How many atoms are in whole atoms? are inside a BCC. Two, we have eight of the corner atoms. We know the corner atoms are shared by eight unit cells. Only one eighth is in each unit cell, so eight times one eighth is one, so eight times one eighth equals one, and you have a body-centered atom. It's one, because it's completely contained within that. So we know we have two atoms, so volume of atoms inside is equals 2 times 4 third pi r cubed. So now, how do we relate the r to the a so that they could cancel out just like it did here? Right? The r's, we were able to relate r to a so that they cancel out and we could calculate a number. How do we do that here? We could use Pythagorean's theorem. So we know that if we're looking at this bottom plane, this is my bottom plane. So it's a square. I have A and I have B. So A squared plus A squared equals B squared. Right? And then if we use that same, so we could calculate B with relationship to A and then Anyone know what that is? B is equal to square root of 2a. So we can replace that here. And now we have a squared plus square root of 2a squared equals c squared. a equals square root of 16 divided by 3 times r. So APF 
equals 2 times 4 third pi r cubed divided by a cubed, the r cancel out, and the APF is 0 0.68 or 68 percent. Okay, so we know that BCC is a more densely packed unicell or den more densely packed crystal structure than a simple cubic. So I would like you to do, figure out what the atomic packing factor is for an FCC on your own. So I know um, it is a little bit difficult, um, maybe a little more difficult for some of you to see the structures in the, or to imagine it in a three-dimensional way. So it helps if you kind of draw some of these on your own with your own, you know, on your piece of paper, what a FCC might look like in a three-dimensional way with lots of unit cells instead of just one, what a BCC might look like. Okay. Mm -hmm.